Well, hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Unlocked Show. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson. You guys are in for an absolute treat this morning because our next guest is an absolutely brilliant but outspoken advocate for disrupting demographics. His books that have been sold all over the world are bestsellers and he speaks internationally and his clients are like on the who's who's list of global businesses. Types of businesses that he's worked with in the past, PayPal, Lululemon, United Nations Foundation, they're just to name a few. And if that didn't make your ears prick up, I don't know what will. So his new book that is about to come out uh, later this year is called The Death of Demographics. And he's given us a sneak peek today. He's going to give us a real insight into human behavior. Now, he's done a huge amount of research in this area from three quarters of a million surveys across 152 different languages, and in today's real exciting episode, I'm going to tell you that he's going to share with you how to use value-driven data to motivate, engage, and activate your prospects' buying decisions. So I want to say a huge big welcome to the amazing David Allison from Value Graphics, the Value Graphics Project. It's awesome to have you here, David, all the way from Vancouver. Absolutely. I'm a little tired and jet lagged. It took a long time to get here, but I love your place. It's worth coming over just to see this. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. We'll have you <laughs> any time. Well, hey guys, I um I have done a whole lot of reading on on David and uh and and really really love what he and his team have been working on over the past few years, and I think as business owners as people that are looking to create their own business, or maybe you're already in business, we are very familiar with the um, trying to understand our target market or who your ideal avatar is. All of these words that I'm speaking now will be very commonplace or very familiar to you. What I'm going to say is that David, in his outspoken manner, is going to really turn the, you know, to flip that on its head and give us some insights into why that is a broken strategy. Why the heck should we just be almost like turfing the old style and the old way that we looked at demographics and be looking at this new way? So I want to um, give David a bit of an opportunity to give us a bit of a backstory. I'm, I'm really intrigued, David, on how did you even get into this field? Because that is a heck of a lot of research, a heck of a lot of time and effort to go into, um, you know, to get to the point that you're at now. So what really was the driving force behind that? Wow. Uh, no one has ever asked me that question before. Uh, and so that's really interesting. It's making me think about how much data we've worked with. 750,000 surveys, as you mentioned, 152 different languages, 436 metrics, 180 mm -hmm. countries. Uh, it's the first global data set of what everybody on the planet's core values are. And I failed high school math. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'd asked me a little while ago how I got here or like if you do you ever imagine yourself getting to this place the answer would be like hard no I can't balance my checkbook so I don't know what I'm doing dealing with all this data right now but the answer really is I spent a long time in marketing uh, mm. a long time I'm, I was all about wanting to I worked in ad agencies back when we had things called ad agencies I went to school to study journalism uh, and then I started working in an ad agency and then another one another one another one and eventually started my own. And we were focused in a, you know, the, the ad agency business goes through waves. And at the moment when I started my own, which is about, uh, oh gosh, now 17 years ago, I guess, ran it really successfully for 10 years. The big thing to do was to specialize. You wanted to be mm -hmm. a specialist. So we specialized in helping real estate developers who are building big condominium towers, resort communities, all over the world, they would come to us and say, hey, David, uh, what should we call this building? And can we do some brochures and a presentation center and a website and billboards and television? Go, yeah, sure. So we were the we were the real estate people. Mm -hmm. uh, and every single time we did this, we were good at it. We did it all over the world. We started in the same way. And it's the same way all your listeners start everything that they're doing, whether they're already have a little business or they're starting to it's growing and it's big or they're just thinking about doing it. You start by trying to define your target audience. Mm. So we would sit down and say, okay, who's going to buy the condos in this tower? And we def we we describe them, and it was inevitably it was I just ended up calling them all Bob and Sally because it was they're all you know retiring baby boomers who are 
downsizing, mm -hmm. empty nesters, selling their single family homes uh, in the in the suburbs and moving to a condominium so they could have a little extra money to get a vacation home somewhere else or whatever it is they're trying to do. And then we go and spend a million bucks. And about three years later, the cool thing about that industry, it's like a, everything has a beginning and a middle and an end. So about three years later, I'd be in a room with all the Bobs and Sallies, the shrimp on a stick, uh, a mm -hmm. On a toothpick uh, mm -hmm. and, a, and a glass of cheap uh, champagne, and looking around and going, you know, there's only about 10 or 15% of the people in the room were Bob's and Sally's. So, who the hell are all the rest of you people? Why are you here? I didn't spend mm -hmm. a dollar talking to you. I had, I didn't put any money into your channels. I didn't do anything to deserve. Thank you for being here, but I, I did not do anything to earn this purchase that's a 10 or 15% success rate on a very large budget. Mm. So that just kept happening over and over and over and over again. And when I sold the company, I said, you know, I'm going to see if I can figure that out. And that's where it began was trying to understand how do people make decisions? How mm. do people end up in that room after all? And so then you go into behavioral science and you start looking at neurology and psychology and psychiatry. And we can talk about all of those if you're interested, but the net effect of doing that work was to discover what they'd all known for a very long time. Scientists in the behavioral sciences have known this and studied this for a very long time. Our values determine everything we do, whether mm. we know it's happening or not. That's the only way we make decisions. That's a really interesting thing. So what you're saying is that over that those very successful years of being, you know, in an in a marketing environment, in an ad agency, and really spending a ton of money, which most people do now, using those old style of demographics, you know, the basic demographics, the psycho demographics, bio demographics, so on and so forth, to try and get. I mean, if you jump into something like Facebook, I mean, those are the things that they're looking for, right? They get you to put in a set of parameters and yeah. then go, now pay me some money and I'll try our best to go and find those people. But yeah. what you're now saying is that when we did that, gosh, I'm burning a whole lot of money and leaving a lot of people on the table because I'm actually targeting a wrong set of metrics, a wrong set of data points. Um, and so through that process, like realizing that, oh my gosh, now I'm in this room with all these people. Yeah, some of them should be here because I targeted them, but a whole lot of others, they, they, they're they here because of some other reason. And so then that stimulated more, um, I'd say more thought and uh, got the old, you know, gray matter working and thinking, why, why is that? Why are these people here? What is the, I suppose, what's the common denominator here that is bringing these people together? So so then, then took me through like this next, you know, the, the cogs are turning yeah. um, and, and you know, obviously you're not thinking about math at this time because if you were thinking, oh, my God, I've got to go down the path of doing some kind of math, probably. Uh, probably run right. away, and run so away like, eh, 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 eh. Ah, yeah, get rid of your But that, that, that curiosity that you had to kind of go, there's more to this than what I've been using and what I've been seeing. So how can I get that information that I know is going to make a huge amount of difference. Let me so tell you. Let me what, tell you what one you little. Let me tell you one little story. I want to tell you a little bit about the behavioral science piece because it's really, oh, really do. important. This was the mm -hmm. light bulb, right? So yeah. if you talk to a neuroscientist, a brain scientist, they'll tell mm -hmm. you that the prefrontal cortex, part of your brain, it's like mm -hmm. your CEO, and yep. all the incoming information, all the sights and sounds and smells, everything your senses collect over the course of, of the day, your CEO lays all this information out on your desk and says, okay, well, if this is what's going on, then here's how we're going to behave. Uh, let's say family is a really important value to you. Your CEO only uses one set of one set of filters to make all these decisions, and, and that's your value. So if family is a very important uh, value and something comes along that might be good for your family, your CEO says, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go get that thing. And when you get that thing, I'm going to reward you with something called happy. Mm -hmm. And something comes along that might be bad for your family. Your CEO says, oh, oh, we get that out of here. Get that off the radar screen. And until you do, I'm going to incense you with something called anxiety or stress or mm -hmm. fear. I'm going to make that. We got to get that out of here. So your, your CEO, your prefrontal cortex is bossing you around. All your emotions feelings, behaviors, decisions, everything you do 
is controlled by that chunk of your brain and it's only making decisions based on your values. It doesn't mm -hmm. care whether you're an 18 to 24 year old or a 25 to 36 mm -hmm. year old or a male or a female, you make hundred thousand dollars a year, you have 2.3 kids and live in the suburbs. It does not care. It only cares what your values are. So that was the moment mm -hmm. where it was like, wow, okay. And all these other scientific fields we won't get into, they all back it up. I thought this is it. If we could figure out for a target audience of people that we want to communicate with to, to engage them or motivate them, whatever word we want to use. If we could just figure out what their values are, we're golden. We just know that's mm. what we have to talk to them about. So I started to see if there was a way to do that and there wasn't. So that's when the value graphics project began. We said, let's build one. Let's make a way to yeah. understand the shared values of a group of people so that instead of talking to them like women who are make $100,000 a year and have a college degree, let's talk to them like people who are mm. driven by ambition and family and environmentalism. Let's know what to say based on what mm. they value. That's where it came from. Mm -hmm. And then understanding, understanding, so what is it that they actually really care about? Because when we understand that, that, that um, piece of the puzzle, then again, they're, they're going to want to listen and pay attention to what it is that you're talking about, right? Quite a, it's a really fascinating thing because, you know, this, this whole concept of understanding values, even um, from a point of view of someone's success in their own life, you know, and often um, we try and create something in our life that we want. But if it's in direct conflict with our core values, we often never achieve that. Because again, like you're saying, that prefrontal cortex kicks in and says, hmm, yeah, nah, that's not in alignment with what your core values are. So yeah, yeah. let's not go there. Let's um let's just let's just kind of take you in a in a different direction. And therefore we see that as, oh my God, it's failure. I'm I'm you know, I, I can't do this, I can't do that, it's not working. Beat thyself up when in fact it's just a disconnection uh between you know what it is that you want and the value. So I just find this fascinating because it it you find it um, seated in, in not just in who our target audience is, but it's in thyself. Sure. And the the here's the thing: psychology is another one of these behavioral sciences, mm. right? And psychologists have you know not to knock psychology, but they've had it easy for a long time because they only got to deal with one person at a time. So they sit down with one person, they go, let's give you an MMPI inventory or a Myers-Briggs test or one mm -hmm. of these other, and we'll figure out what your values are. And then you're going to lie down on my nice comfy couch, couch over there. And we're going to like make sure that your life and your values are in alignment. That's what the work of going to see your therapist is about. Yeah. And if your values and your life are not in alignment, you're a misaligned, unhappy person. And the more you can get them in alignment, the more psychologically stable and happy you are. So that's that's relatively easy to do compared to what we want to do, which is mm. understand which values an entire group of people that we don't get to talk to, what ones do they have in common? And we want to know about that before we spend our money. Mm. We don't want to know about it after because sociologists, they study groups of people and why they behave, right? So after an election, they can go and talk to people who voted for this person versus that person and figure out what their values are and say, oh, okay, well, these vo people voted for that guy because of these values and they voted for this person over here because of these values. So that's, that's afterwards, still not what we need as marketers and business people. Mm. We need to know before they voted which way they're going to vote so that or or purchase or decide or you know i want product a or product b or service a or service b how do we know that before they do it that's a whole mm. different level of analysis and that's what we've made with the so the value graphics project started to collect values from everybody on earth and we now got to this point where we've hit three quarters of a million surveys we've done and we can go into all kinds of detail around that but basically we've created a what's called a random stratified statistically representative sample. It's a fun thing to say after two martinis at a party, random mm -hmm. stratified statistically representative sample. Uh, the cool kids call it a random Stratstat rep. So a random Stratstat rep, which is like a miniature Lego model of the world. And mm -hmm. it's accurate by 
age and income and country and population, and all those kinds of things. So we have our own little model now. And while we were collecting that, we were asking everybody questions about what's important to them. What are their values? What are their wants and needs and expectations? So when we go and pull data out of there, it's accurate for the whole planet because it's a model of the whole planet. It's done in a very mm. particular statistical way. So it's never been done before. We've never had a random Strastat rep of the population of planet Earth. And now we can learn all kinds of things about what's important to people. And also, here's a fun twist. We can understand with stats why demographics don't make sense anymore. So mm. I'll give you a couple of numbers that just rock your world. Go back to that story I was telling about being in that room with the champagne and the sh mm -hmm. shrimp on a stick. Mm -hmm. Uh, and 10 or 15% of the people in the room matched the target audience description and everyone else was a big mystery. So it turns out if you look at all the demographic labels that we're all familiar with, gender, income, marital status, number of kids, education, all that kind of stuff, how similar are the people inside any one of those buckets? That's one of the things we've learned from making this random stress stat rep model of the world. So we can look at every one of those little buckets of people and say, okay, 18 to 24 year olds, 25 to 36 year olds, people who earn a hundred thousand dollars a year, people have one kid, two kids, married, single, divorced. How similar are those people? In other words, how targetable are they? Mm. They have to be similar if they're targetable, right? The answer, if you average it out across the board, is 10.5%. Mm. People in a demographic category are only, let's round it off, 10% similar. So if you target a group of people based on demographics, you say, my target audience is 25 to 36 year old women who earn $100,000 a year and have a college education and they're not married, but they'd like to be. Uh, and um, they, uh, I don't know, uh, have a degree in economics. Mm -hmm. Cool. What you've done is taken a bunch of demographic groups that agree with each other about 10% of the time, put them on top of each other to make a bigger demographic group of people that agrees with each other about 10% of the time. And then you go and spend a million dollars trying to get them to do something. That's a built-in guaranteed 90% fail rate. Because mm -hmm. the best you can hope for in that scenario is about 10% success. Mm -hmm. So I look now back at that room full of people from my real estate days and go, that's what happened. I was talking to a demographic and I got about 10, 15% of the people match the demographic. You know why everyone else was there though? They were identical to the group I chased. I just mm. was using the wrong lenses. I was looking at them demographically and going, who are you people? You're not the demographic. But what happened was inadvertently, I was saying things, I was talking to values that made all those people come into the room. So their values were identical. That's why they were all there. I just couldn't yeah. see it because values are on the inside, not on the outside. Mm. Isn't that interesting that that level of perspective or looking at things through a different lens brought you that, um, you know, that, that, amount of detail and that kind of like aha moment that there is the one common denominator here and that is their values yeah. and that obviously has then gone wow let's just you know and then researching and asking thousands and thousands of people millions of people around the world you know a set of very specific questions that also help you to narrow that down and go yep that's the thing. It comes down to their values. So I want to ask you this question, because for, for so many decades, for such a long time, we have been kind of going down the path of old school demographics, is what you'd call them now. Like they worked in the past, but they don't work now. Yeah. And, I, and I'm really interested to know what is your insight into why you think that is the case? Like I know you've said, you know, Previously, in the olden days, we did things in a certain way, which was to kind of keep society flourishing. And now they have become meaningless. What's actually happened um, to, to, to make them now irrelevant? Yeah. Well, a couple things. Let's start back by just painting a picture of a couple thousand years ago. You're in a 
little little town in let's say um, uh, rural France somewhere, maybe even sooner than that. You're a, you're with your tribe. It's it's uh, back in the Neanderthal days. Well, women had to be making babies by the time they were 14 or they were not pulling their weight. And that meant we would, did not have enough population for the next generation. And so the village down the street would be growing while ours was shrinking. So women, get out there and make mm -hmm. some babies. Men, if you're 12 or 13 years old and you don't know how to work a spear and a sword, and you're not out killing the bad guys and bringing home a bison for us to eat for dinner tonight, you're not doing your job. Because if you're not doing that, nobody else is going to do it and you're not feeding us and we're not going to be healthy. And old people, your job was to sit around and be wise and to tell everybody what the stories were that made the universe come together. And you had to be the ones who were artists and craftsmen and so on and so on and so on. Rich people, poor people, young people, old people, we all had a job to do. And if we did not do it, things fell apart. We wouldn't survive. Our species would get eaten by the other guys. Uh, it was it was, it was all about survival. And then along came this thing that changed all that called technology. Mm -hmm. As soon as technology came along and think back to the early days, I mean, technology wasn't all about computer chips, right? Technology was even just simple things like a train. Once we were mobile and able to move from one part of the country to another, isn't it before airplanes, we were able to start thinking about our lives based on what was available to us in a much broader sense. We didn't have to stay in our little village and just scrabble our lives together. Then you fast forward another few hundred years and new kinds of technologies are available. And today, you know, I'm just skipping over a millennia of technological development here. But today, because of technology and its leveling influence on our lives, we can all kind of live more or less however we like. Now, there's exceptions. Somebody always puts up a hand and goes, yeah, what about the?" Of course, there's still a lot of work to be done in many places in the world and within many um, underrepresented and marginalized groups. But largely, education is available where mm. in the past only a few people got to be educated. And largely, we're healthy. In the past, that was a rare, rare thing to live past mm -hmm. the age of 30 or 40 years old. That would make you an old, ancient man or woman. We can choose what we want to watch, the books we want to read, the television shows we're going to be exposed to, the films and movies, the movie stars we want to be uh, you know, following around. Our lives are kind of up to us to curate however we want today. We don't have to behave mm -hmm. in old-fashioned ways that women do a certain thing and men do a certain thing. It doesn't happen anymore. And yet... Mm -hmm. We still sit in our companies and say, well, uh, who are we going to talk to here? We need to talk to women who are a certain age. And like that makes sense. Like they're going to be all the same. Here's another way to think about it. Good, a funny little story. You're in, a, you're in a stadium and you're standing in the middle of the stadium. It's just you in the middle of the stadium. And the, the seats around you are filled. They're filled with women who are 18 to 24. I want you to picture this. They're 18 to 24 year old women in the stadium. They all have their college degree and they're all single. Let's stop there. An entire stadium filled with women who are 18 to 24 and have a college degree and are single. How similar do you think they're all gonna be? Just using common sense. I bet there's gonna be all kinds of people in that stadium. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense to think in that scenario that they're all going to respond to the same thing. If you had to get them to say yes to buying, I'll often talk about a chocolate bar. Give me one thing you can say to that stadium full of people that'll get them all to say yes to buying your chocolate bar. It's impossible. But if I told mm. you one more thing, one more thing, in addition to what we know demographically, if I told you that their most important value in their life was let's go with health and well-being now can you say one thing that'll get all of those 18 to 24 year old women with a college degree and are single can you get them all to say yes yeah you can say this is the uh -huh. healthiest chocolate bar in the world uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you're in uh -huh. so that's the power of values the demographics they don't give you anything what are you going to do make things pink because they're women uh -huh. 
uh, like it's just nonsense, right? But mm. one value, and you know what to say. Now, what if I could tell you their top five values that they all have in common? That they're all about personal growth and ambition and health and well being and environmentalism. Well, now you can write a novel about your chocolate bar that'll get them super excited. That's what we mm. need to do. Start thinking about people that way instead of the outward stuff. Let's look at the inside stuff. Yeah. I mean, I know, I mean, you know, when you put it like that, I mean, what would you rather, right, is go down the path of that demographics and hope like heck that you may reach 10.5% of your audience or be able to really pinpoint and, like you say, understand their values, be able to, uh, you know, craft your message in a way that absolutely hits the nail on the head and they all go, yeah, 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 I want it. Um, yeah. That because that's me, yeah. right? That's that's because I'm now seeing that you understand me. I and you're talking about the things that I actually care about, rather than just making me a number, you know, which is traditionally what what what, what has been done in the past. Yeah, we like to say, this mm -hmm. is if you speak into someone's values, you're speaking deep inside their heart, like a trusted friend. Because the way mm -hmm. your friends talk to you, they know you. They're going to sit you down and yeah. go, listen, I've been meaning to say something about this. And they're going to know how to frame up a message to get you to go, oh, my gosh, you're right. Or, oh, my gosh, yeah, let's go do that thing. Or whatever it is mm -hmm. you're trying to get them to do. Because you know how to say it to them because you're friends with them. And what being friends is, is being values aligned. That's what being friends mm -hmm. is, is you understand and you respect and you resonate on each other's values. So... If you could do that with your customers, your prospects, your employees, think how powerful that would be. Well, mm. if you understand their values, oh, here's the other side of that coin, of course. Every client who comes to us says, here's our demographics. This is the target audience. We go, okay, but you know, there might be, say, no, no, these are the people we want to talk to. What are their values? I go, okay. So we go and do our work and we come back and say, for that group of people, here's the values they share. And by the way, there's all these other people over here and all these other people over here that don't fit your demographic that also share those values. So you are going to get them if you talk and suddenly it's like, okay, well, why am I so worried about sticking inside the boundaries? Why don't I just like let the values be the way people find me instead of me predetermining There's so many products like the, the founders sit down and say, I'm targeting women who are entrepreneurs in 18 to 24 years old. I keep picking on 18 mm. because it's easy to say. Uh, and then they find out when they launch their product that why, why am I getting all these old people? Well, I'll, I'll take their money. I'm happy to. So instead of that, why don't you just say, I'm targeting people who have this value, this value, and this value. You're going to get all kinds of ages and all kinds of uh, other sorts of demographics coming after you. You're going to find out you got a way bigger audience than you thought if you just put mm -hmm. the blinders on and say, these are the only people I want. Mm. I mean, th this kind of does flip a lot of those traditional marketing um, you know, strategies and techniques on their head because, you know, just with what you've said there around, right, we're going to focus on the demographics and we're going to get really niched and work on a very specific type of person. What you're saying now is, well, actually, that's a whole lot of garbage. You don't need to do that because if you focus on this, you're you're actually widening your market, but you're widening it in a widening it in a very specific thoughtful way to be able to capture the people who are going to feel like they belong, going to feel like that's my place. I'm no longer a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. I'm that square peg in a square hole or a round peg in a round hole because I've, I've, I've landed, so to speak. I, I found my peoples. Yeah. yeah I love I mean, it. I remember one big uh, uh, clothing manufacturer who came to us at one mm. point and said, we're really confused. We've spent all kinds of money coming up with our personas. Uh, we mm. have a client, we have a customer and his name's Joe and he's uh, this old and we know this about him and stuff. And so we design our clothes and our stores and everything so that Joe is happy uh, and is going to come buy our stuff. And then we go and stand in our store and there's all these other people that don't resemble Joe. Why are they there? Same problem I had every time we did a real estate project. They're just like, wow, how, how do we understand the entirety of the people who are actually buying our stuff mm. instead of this fictitious character that we've come up with? 
you know, the other way to think about this, because I don't want to make it sound like demographics aren't useful. They're still useful. And I'm holding my reading glasses because it's a great example. We're not going to sell. You and I are suddenly in the reading glasses business. We're going to make reading. Ray can sell reading glasses. And these are really expensive reading. They're, they made of diamonds and platinum and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So they're not going to sell to 18 year olds. And they're not going to sell to people who don't have very much money. So we know we need to talk to rich old people. Uh, and let's say they're super wide, like these ones are. So they're kind of more for a man than they are for a woman. So rich old guys, that's who we're trying to talk to. Mm -hmm. But here's what the problem is. That's true in this case. But we then think that they're all the same. That rich old mm -hmm. guys are somehow all going to respond to the same message and have the same values. And that's not true. We're back in the stadium now. We're filling those stadium seats with rich old guys and thinking they're all going to be one way or another. We're all like one thing or something than something else. But if you just tell me that those rich old guys, their biggest thing in their life is, I don't know, let's pick one of the other values, social standing. They want everybody to know how much they paid for those glasses. So you need to find a way for them to brag when they're wearing those glasses. They better have big honking logos on them so that everybody mm -hmm. can see how much those glasses cost at a glance. Uh, mm -hmm. No subtlety for this group. Whereas another group of rich old guys might be that they don't want social standing at all. They don't want any logos. They're more about balance or they're more about relationships. They don't want to push anybody away make anybody feel uncomfortable. They want to bring people towards them and mm -hmm. make people feel like they're approachable. So they'll still buy your glasses, but you got to talk to them in a different way than that other group who wants everybody to you know, see where I'm going with this. It's just a really Absolutely. common thing. So, so I know that a lot of people are now going to go, okay, well, I get that. Yeah, right. I'm going to focus on, on values. Now, you, based on this research that you've done, I know you've kind of narrowed this down to a to a, a set. There is a specific number yeah. of values. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that came about, how many there are, how you, how you narrowed it down to this number? And maybe for, like, I'd be really interested to know, because I know a lot of the audience is going to be, you know, um, American, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand kind of based. Um, how does that play out in terms of, I suppose, you know, wh wh where they live? Is, is there any differences? What are some of the most interesting things you've found? In oh, doing my gosh, Casey, there's like 10 questions. Sorry, I that. know there was. You know, <laughs> I know. Look, I'm just giving you an opportunity. I know you're going to kind of go blah, 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 blah. Yeah, OK, here we go. Those things that you got it. <laughs> uh, so there are 56 values. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool to know. Uh, before we started this, we didn't know that. Uh, and mm. we didn't go out there with a preconceived notion of how many there would be. We let the survey responses identify how many there are. So it's kind of like yeah. um, you guys, you, I uh, don't, some parts of the world you do Halloween where your kids go out and you get a bag of candy and they come back at the end of the day, all dress up in costumes. Is that a, is that a Oceania thing? Does it happen? Not so much. It is. It is becoming a. Uh, okay, a, there's a big part of my childhood. Anybody in mm -hmm. Canada, the United States, every year at, at Halloween, you're like out dressed like a ghost or a pirate or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and you go door to door and people give you candy and you come home with a big pillowcase. Generally, it was a pillowcase. Mm -hmm. You come home with a pillowcase full of candy. So that's us out doing our research. We just went and talked to people all over the world in certain places and certain kinds of people, so that we could build that accurate model. We ask them about their life and what's important to them and all these things. They take all that data and we come home and just like kids at Halloween, you, you dump the bag of candy on the dining room table and you look and see what you got. And you go, wow, uh, there's a bunch of things here we could put in a group called chocolate. And there's a bunch of things here we could put in a group called uh, candy that's on a stick. And there's a bunch of things here that go in another group called single individual wrapped candies. So we didn't know what we were going to get, but once we looked mm -hmm. at it, we're like, wow, you know what? This group's up into 56 kinds of values that drive what people do. Now, let's put that number into context for a moment because it's kind of remarkable when you think about it. Um, that's 56 things that are responsible for everything that every human will ever do or say or feel or believe or think. It's the root cause of all human activity. This is like mm. the operating system for our species on this planet. And there's 
88 keys on a piano. It's more complicated to learn how to play happy birthday than it is to understand all the inputs that drive humans to do everything they're ever going to do. That's a pretty mm. cool thing to know. Now, from there, you asked about uh, if there's regional variations and differences. Mm. And absolutely, they are. Because we get our values when we're young. In our mm. late childhood and early adolescence, the sociologists call this process in your development, they call it socialization. And depending on who's influential at that moment in your life, your parents, your friends, your teacher, you know, some other adult in the neighborhood, an uncle, I don't know who it might be. Those influential people form your values. And by your late adolescence, they're locked and they're yours for the rest of your life. They never are going to change. You're fully formed as an adult with a set of values you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. So that socialization process is different in different parts of the world, depending on what mm. the traditions and customs and cultures of, of the places and the people and the times you're living in. So, of course, those 56 values in different parts of the world, different ones are at the top of the list and then they move down. And sometimes they're not on the list except way at the bottom. And in another part of the world, they're way up at the top. But it's not just regionality or even by cities or even by neighborhood. It's by brand and it's by hobby and it's by because remember values drive everything we do so if you play soccer yeah. the reason you've decided to play soccer or football whatever it is you call it in your part of the world uh the reason you've decided to do that is because a set of values felt aligned around that so you went and did that so every tiny group that you can describe to me you can say people who are gonna this afternoon eat yogurt and then go for a walk. I can figure out why those people are eating yogurt and going for a walk because it's their values that made them choose that they're going to sit down and eat yogurt and then go for a walk. So that's a silly mm -hmm. case to, to, to make my point. So yes, there are regional differences. There are city differences. There are differences right down to the level of every tiny little group you can possibly imagine. So let me give you a couple of examples because you told me you had a lot of friends listening in the uh, United States and Canada and a lot of friends mm -hmm. in Oceania, let's call it. So we do uh, our, our the way we break up the world is in nine regions. One region is the U.S. and one region is Oceania. So I pulled a little bit of fun information here. I looked at the top 10 most important values to these entire regions of the world. Uh, and in Oceania, there's two that don't show up in the top 10 in the United States. Mm -hmm. And similarly, there's two in the United States that don't show up in Oceania. So where do you want to start? Well, given that I'm, you know, from Oceania, I'm originally from New Zealand, now I live in Australia. Let's let's go there. Okay. So the two that show up in your top 10 that do not show up in the United States are community mm -hmm. and a really lovely value called personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you about these people. People who are driven by community. Now, think about the word community. Community can mean lots of different things to lots of different people, right? I live in Vancouver, so I'm part of that community. Uh, I go to a gym that's about six blocks away, and I go pretty much all the time. And so there's a bunch of guys I always see there. That's another community I'm part of. Um, we have a little uh, cottage up the coast, and there's a little town there. That's another community I'm part of. Lots of communities I'm part of. People who are put a lot of importance on the value of community will make all their decisions on how it's going to impact their communities. Mm -hmm and which decision is going to give them more of a sense of community. So that's a driving force in your part of the world that does not exist in the top 10 in the United States. Not mm -hmm. overall, and there's certain people for whom it will, of course, but as an entire region, way more important where you are than in the United States. The other one. Mm -hmm. the By person, the way, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, no, it sounds right. You, you need to to Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then personal responsibility people. These are people who you will never hear them say, you know what someone should do about that? These are people who get up off the couch and go do that thing. Mm -hmm. These are people who want to know that their actions are responsible for making the needle move. So in a, mm -hmm. in a business setting, you know, these are the people you want to say, hey, thank you for, um, I don't know, coming to my store. Uh, would you like to do, uh, look at things this way or look at things this way? 
you've just made me personally responsible for my experience. I get to decide, I get to be the decider. Mm -hmm. I'm all over that because personal responsibility is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think about the frequent flyer program I have from the airline that I fly with the most. And because I'm like platinum princess, emerald, admiral, something, something class mm -hmm. uh, with them now, uh, when my package of goodies arrives every year and they say, here's all the treats you get because you fly so much, you poor sod, uh, here's uh, a whole list of stuff and you can choose which ones you want out of there. You get to pick three. Here's another whole list of stuff. You choose the ones out of there you want and you get to pick three. They've made me responsible for designing my own loyalty rewards. Mm -hmm. They've made me personally responsible for that happening. So there's two things about my Oceania friends. They want to be the ones who get stuff done and they're very concerned and motivated by their communities. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about that in the United States. Those things are not in the top 10, but what is that are not in the top 10 over in uh, Oceania are two values that are also very, very fascinating. One is health and well-being. Now, that one is hard for me to get my head around as a Canadian because we all think about the stereotypical American mm. and the, the idea of the stereotypical American is not a really healthy and well person. They tend to be portrayed uh, stereotypically as not in great shape and not eating a lot of really good food and, you know, not um, – as focused on that, like that mythical Norwegian that they're always being compared to. A Norwegian male at age 50 is, you know, incredibly fit and blah, blah, blah. And an American male, there's always these comparisons. But here's the thing about health and well being like all values, it's in the eye of the beholder. So I have friends in my yeah. life, for example, uh, for whom they drink a bottle of wine with dinner every night. And if they go for a week where they only drink half a bottle of wine every night, they think they're just being the healthiest thing since sliced bread because they only they they halved their alcohol intake. Like, wow. And mm -hmm. then I have other friends who are constantly training for an Ironman or a, or a marathon and like two or three or four times a year, they go and they just push themselves to the limit and climb seven mountains and swim across an ocean and do all this crazy stuff. I can't imagine. And volunteering to do that. It sounds like punishment to me, but for them, that's how they have to be healthy and well, and both are fine and both fit into the definition of health and well-being. because I don't really care what your version of it is as a sociological data company. What mm -hmm. I care is being able to identify that this motivates you health and well-being mm -hmm. motivates you, whatever your version of that might be. So that's something that's unique to Americans and their own idea of what health and well-being is not unique to them entirely, but unique to them compared to Oceania. The other one for America is uh, loyalty. Mm. Fiercely loyal. Um, now, again, it can be interpreted however someone wants. We didn't go out and say, here's what loyalty means. We listened to what people said and we went, well, loyalty is a big deal here. This is These folks are all talking about loyalty. So loyalty, I mean, I guess a little anecdote I have about that. Look at how fiercely right now Americans are being loyal to a political party. Mm. Either side of that debate, there's a fierce, overwhelming desire to remain loyal in the face of all kinds of evidence that might make you think otherwise. And I'm not taking sides here. It's going on both sides. But the loyalty that these folks have makes it very difficult for them to switch sides or to change their mind. Mm. Uh, and so there you go. There's a couple of things that make Americans different than uh, my friends in Oceania. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about those things that you're, you're talking about and knowing, you know, spend a bit of time in, in America, um, you've done a lot of research, got a lot of uh, clients that are in that space, and obviously coming from New Zealand and now living in Australia, you know, you're talking about those things. I can see how, you know, those those are almost indoctrinated into you as like you're talking about, you know, they become what you know from a child and then you then take those on as your values and that's what you live with um, yeah. as an adult. You know, that those are, you know, if and like you say, if 
in America, typically speaking, the stereotype is, you know, not very healthy, um, don't eat well, you know, all of those sorts of things. So potentially that's, you know, they think that. So therefore, you know, I really need to focus on my health and well-being because typically we're, we're, we're not that type of person. Whereas New Zealand, if I think about New Zealand and Australia, we don't really like that's even though I think on the spectrum, Australia is also on um, quite high up in the unhealthy uh, realm of of uh, of population globally. But it's not something that we hear about on the regular where, you know, in America, you tend to hear that um, fairly frequently. And the same with loyalty, you know, um, very like patriotic Americans are, you know, pledge their allegiance to the country, that sort of thing. So I can really see how that kind of plays out in, in that um, in that space. Now, the next question I've got that leads off from that is, are there specific questions that we can be asking ourselves to try and determine what our, you know, what what are the values that I should be speaking into? What are the oh, yeah. values that I, yeah, I, okay, I knew you'd cool. have an answer for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I want to back up for just a second and tell you why I'm going to tell you what I'm about to tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mission, my vision, what I'm trying to accomplish with this is I want us all to think about how we can be values driven. Mm. Now, for some big corporations, they need this in the form of really precise data. So one way we can get to a values driven view of each other and of the world around us is by, you know, commissioning my company and we can do a really bang up job with amazing academic accuracy and tell you exactly what your stakeholders, your customers, your even your secretly between you and me, I can tell you what your competitors' customers are all about. So there's all kinds of things we can do, but that stuff's not cheap and it's not for everybody. So, uh, you know, if you're a big giant Fortune 500, you want to talk, let's talk. Second way, it's going to cost you about $16, $17 Canadian. And I think Canadian dollars are pretty much on par with Australian dollars. So you can get my current book on Amazon. It's called We Are All the Same Age Now. Uh, and it has the Canadian and American data in it and a quiz with 10 questions. And those 10 questions you can ask anybody. You can send it out on SurveyMonkey or uh, whatever your CRM system is, however you poll your customers and your clients, your friends, whatever. Uh, and the answers will lead you to one of 10 chapters in the book. And those mm -hmm. 10 chapters... Each chapter is devoted to one of what we call the archetypes in the data. So those archetypes are like the biggest, biggest tribes inside the data set for Canada mm -hmm. and the United States. So that's the book I came out with about five years ago. Bestseller, sold a whole lot of copies all over the place. Here's the thing. I don't want it to sound like I'm shilling the book because anybody who's ever put a book on Amazon, you know, you make about 70 cents a copy. So everybody mm -hmm. looks They'd have to buy 20 copies and I might have enough for a, you know, a mm -hmm. bottle of wine. So it's not about making money, but there is a quiz in there that for the price of book you can use. And it's pretty darn accurate, way more accurate than continuing to use demographics. I understand your audience. Mm. And then the good news for the rest of the world is uh, I hate to give an actual date because it might not happen. But you know what this is like uh, on the 29th of November, all things being equal, my new book will be out and it has the same quiz in it for the whole planet. So anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. it's got to be 15 questions because there's a whole lot of different kinds of people when you get outside of Canada, the United States. So 15 questions you can send out to your database. Uh, you can use it. If you're a small retailer, print them up as a little thing and put them in the bags with everything that you pack and that you hand to people. If they come in your store, you're shipping it out online any way you can to collect responses. Offer people a little, you know what we do sometimes when we need to get people to respond to things, the smallest incentive will get people mm -hmm. to say yes and fill out your form. We will often say, help us by filling out this thing. Uh, it's only a few questions and you'll be entered for a chance to win a $50 Amazon gift card. They don't need the Amazon gift card. You need to buy one of those and give everybody a chance to win it. That's enough sometimes to get people to go, okay, sure, I'll fill out the little form. So... Those are those ways. Now, here's the free way. Absolutely free. For eight years now, we've been refining 
what we call the three telltale questions. Mm-hmm. You just ask people these three questions often enough, you're going to start to hear patterns in the response. You can think about them as signals in the noise. These questions get to the root of why people do the things that they do. Now, it's not as accurate as the 10 questions or the 15 questions in the books, and it's certainly not as accurate as hiring us to do a custom study for you. But it's a great way to just start seeing the world with a values-driven lens. So here's question one. Why do you go to work every day? If you ask that of all kinds of people, like every time you meet someone, it's a good thing to ask at a dinner party or you go to a a mixer or a fundraiser or a networking thing. Just say, hey, why do you go to work? You'll start Mm -hmm. to hear patterns and people will tell you it's because that's my creative outlet or it's my family or it gets me out of the house. Or, I mean, you'll start, everyone has a different way of talking about it, but the patterns will, those themes are the values bubbling to the surface. So that's question one. Question two. Why would you give away half of your lottery winnings? Now, this one's a little trickier. You got to probe sometimes because people will say, oh, I'd give it to the local football. I say, no, no, not who. Why would you give away half of your lottery winnings? Same thing. You're trying to get down to what's the motivation behind this mm. big decision, right? Yeah. So those motivations as they start to come up, you listen to them and that's values bubbling to the surface. And the third one's my favorite one. This one I frequently will ask my friends. Uh, we'll be sitting around a dinner table, a couple glasses of wine, throw this one out and you really start to understand some people. Here you go. You get to write a letter to yourself from 10 years ago. What would you say and why? That's a fascinating thing to think about just yourself. If you can say, what would I say to myself from 10 years ago and why those things? You really start to understand what's motivating you today. So Mm -hmm. those three questions. Now, let's say you're a small, uh, medium-sized business. You can't afford to go hire a big research firm, do all this work for you. Just train your frontline staff, whoever's interacting with people to, in their own words, ask those three questions as many times as possible. Make it easy for them to jot down the responses. Take six months. Just keep asking. Keep asking. Uh, Every time you're at a conference, every time you run into a bunch of people who are your customers, ask one or two or three of those questions. Keep writing them down. Eventually, if you collect enough responses, you're going to like the Halloween candy. You're going to be able to look at them all and go, oh, my gosh, all my people are driven by personal growth and personal responsibility. And Mm. then you know what to talk about. You take your product or service, your brand, and you figure out a way to tell your story, build your thing, design your whatever, so that it's all about how it's going to help you grow as a person and make you more personally responsible. That's it. Nice and simple. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, those three questions, like I said, I say this all the time on the Unlock Show, right? For our listeners, I want you guys to make sure that we walk away from today's show. If you've been listening, you want to take action on the things that we've spoken about. So David's just given you a really simple, free way of being able to start the process of really understanding that customer at a deep level and understanding their values with those three questions. So if you haven't already written them down, I want you to pause this, go back, replay it, grab those questions that he's just rattled off for us and embed them into the way in which you do things in your business to start gathering that data. Because like he says, when you start doing it and you start seeing, ask enough people, you will start to create a your own database, your own patterns. You'll be able to pick up the different values and behaviors and a whole raft of other things that is going to give you some really valuable insight into who the people are that, A, you should care about and actually care about you you know and, and that makes and, and a, a huge difference hey yeah and why and why because do they care they're your customers mm-hmm. for one reason their values made them your customers so if you can figure out what those are you know why they're coming you don't you guess what you get to do you don't have to do any of the stuff anymore that has nothing to do with their values you just forget about that stuff double down on the stuff that's all about their values mm-hmm. you get to just 
take all your money and time that you're kind of wasting right now, spraying it out there and hoping some of it sticks. Something's working because they're your customers. But if you can figure out why, what's what's working, stop spending that 90% of your dollars and hours on the stuff that's not happening and focus it all on the stuff that will move the needle. You're going to just see an exponential growth. And yeah, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but I have one what, more really important message what, before yeah, we leave. Thank you. You want me to go? go for, absolutely. Okay. Here's the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. It's all good that we've got a better way to understand people and a better way to get them to, to motivate them, to engage them, to activate them, influence them. That's great. It helps us all do a better job. But when we do that, we're part of something much, much bigger and much, much more important. And here's what it is. The longer we continue to use demographics to understand people and say, age, my people are this age, so here's what we think we know about them. What you're doing is saying, it's okay to think about people based on age. Mm. And when we say, my people are that age and they're women, that means we're saying to everyone around us and the world that it's okay to continue to come up with messages and products and services and talk to people because they're women. That makes mm -hmm. no sense. Those things, that's called ageism. Mm -hmm. And this one, that's called sexism. And the same thing happens and fuels racism and homophobia. And so many of the problems that we're grappling with right now are because we keep talking to each other and thinking about each other based on what we look like on the outside. Very stereotypical. It's totally right? yeah. reinforcing mm -hmm. stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Now, all we have to do to change that and stop that terrible force in the world is to just change how we look at each other. Mm -hmm. It's that easy. We don't have to build factories or invest a bazillion dollars. You just got to change how you look at people and you're going to do much better with your companies and you're meeting your objectives and make money, all that kind of stuff. And you're going to help make the world a little bit more of a united, happy mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important that we do this because it's how we're going to be able to do well and at the same time do a whole lot of good. And that doesn't happen very often in our lives. What a, what a great opportunity we have right now to really shift the way in which we think about this to, like you say, to stop the division that is going on and really start to unite. And, and that, just that alone, is going to you know, create win-win-win solutions and opportunities all over the globe by just shifting the way in which we think about the human race and how we how we how we start communicating with them yes. so I, I have absolutely loved this conversation and and david and i sort of talked about this at the beginning when we often have a bit of a chat before we jump uh, live on the show and we knew that this was going to be one of those topics that we could just talk for hours and hours on <laughs> um, but you know we've we've got to cut it off somewhere and um when we're at the top of the hour so it's highly likely that we'll have david back again because i think this is just such a fascinating topic that is relevant if you're starting out in business, you're just, you know, you're a solopreneur, you're small right now, but it's equally as important for those that have got large Fortune 500 companies. If you're a massive company, this is relevant. So, you know, switching our thought pattern from today forward, from the old school demographics to now being you know, the death of demographics, which is the book that David's um, David's been speaking about that is due to come out on the 29th of November. So when it does, I'll make sure that I pop that into the show notes so that you guys can be one of the first to go and grab a copy of that book, because I have no doubt that there is going to be some really insightful um, information inside of that book that is really going to help you to 10x. Hey, I know he talks about sort of the 8x multiplier. We'll talk about that another time, you know, sort of how thinking like this really does stretch your budget and enables you to get 
a eight times multiplier on you know on your efforts so we'll talk about that perhaps in another episode but I know that you're going to understand that at a much deeper level if you go and purchase his book so I know you know he was very humble in saying this is not a about selling my book and it never is because as he said, you're not going to make. He's not going to make millions of dollars by selling his book. But yeah. what he is going to do is be able to impact your life and impact the lives of the other people in which you serve and you help from the moment forward that you read his book or the moment forward from you listening to today's episode. So I want to thank him very, very much for his wisdom, for his um, willingness to share this information with our audience and I hope that David will be back on the Unlock show again if you guys have got any questions because I'm sure you will have because hmm. I, we've just flipped everything that you now thought was the way to go around demographics we flipped that on its head so you probably you know got a whole lot of questions still floating around in your mind I want you to do there's a couple of things you can do you can go and find the Facebook group called success success secrets for business family and life it's on facebook it's free jump in there you will see this episode when you see this episode in there i want you to write your questions in the comment section you can do the same on youtube and also on the podcast if you're listening on the podcast make sure that you reach out go to tracymwilson.com send me a message through uh, my website and we'll be sure to make sure that we answer all of those questions and like i said if we're lucky enough to be able to uh, grab some more of, uh, of, um, of David's time, then we'll have him back as a guest in a future episode. But I say thank you very much. It's been a fantastic conversation. I'm sure our listeners have got a lot of value uh, and insight in what you've spoken about today. Thanks for having me over. I have one last question for you. Go for it. I love your accent so much. I want to hear you say, ladies and gentlemen, David Allison. All righty, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, David Allison. Listen, there you go. It's Did like you music. Grab that? It's like music. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of like this crazy um, combination between a Kiwi Aussie accent and because I speak with loads of Americans, it kind of, I don't know, my friends here in Australia and also in New Zealand say, God, you've picked up some American kind of, you know, twang in there somewhere. So I don't know. I've got this kind of crazy little accent going on, but it's a lot of fun. But anyway, guys, like I always say, you know, we go live with the Unlock Show every Wednesday and every Friday, 10 a.m. Brisbane time. So if you want to learn more about how to unlock, you know, and, and live a life that you are going to love across your business, your family and your life, you want to tune into the Unlock Show because I have some amazing guests on here. And like I always say, go and live your life unlocked because there just is no other way. Thanks, guys. See you again on another episode. Bye for now.